Good morning. Good morning. This is Ian Beale from CB. Uh, delighted to be hosting another webinar jointly with the IRM. Uh, today we're talking about, well, this morning we're talking about combined assurance, and uh, it's a pleasure to be running another another webinar uh, this morning. We've got, I think, 75 minutes scheduled for uh, this morning's webinar. I'm so delighted to be here from a very chilly London. Um, we have a lot of people uh, dining into the webinar, and the numbers going up uh, at, at the moment. So welcome to to everybody, wherever you you, you may be. Um, and a particular welcome, I know uh, one of our clients based at a bank, I won't mention the name, based at a bank in Athens. There's several of you in a room dialing in listening to this, so a very warm welcome to, to you from hopefully a much warmer Athens than it is here uh, in London. But welcome to everybody, wherever you're dialing, dialing in from. Um, I've run several of these webinars uh, for, for and with the IRM over the last year or so, so if you've heard me before, welcome back. If you haven't, then uh, nice, to, nice to meet you virtually, at least, o over the webinar. Um, CB is a research organization. Uh, we have recently um, joined forces with Gartner. Uh, you may have seen that in the news over the last few weeks, and that officially all became uh, real uh, a couple of weeks ago. So you can see the bottom center of this page, CEB is, is now Gartner. Um, this webinar, as normal, is going to be recorded. The replay will be available through, um, through Bright Talk. Uh, uh, very soon after the webinar is finished. And if you want to download the material, stay with us right to the end, because on the very last page, we'll explain how to get access to the webinar deck uh, through the URL. Um, I'm going to be asking a couple of questions of the group during the webinar. Um, we'll, we'll put those up on the screen for you uh, at different times during the webinar, get your input uh, and feedback on a couple of questions. Also, I'm going to want to get ask your feedback on, on the webinar. It's very important for us at CB, Gartner, and also for the IRM to make sure we're delivering great webinars uh, to the audience and, and that you are um, getting value from the time you're going to spend with us. So uh, you should see a feedback uh, button on your screen. So uh, do fill that in. Stay with us until the end to, so you can listen to the, to the full, uh, full thing. It's, it's, called rate, it's called Rate This. Rate This. Um, so do, do give us your feedback um, before you leave the webinar at the end of the hour or so that we've got together. Um, and also, if you want to post a question, uh, I can see I already have a question. I will try uh, and keep, uh, keep an eye on the questions that are, that are coming through um, and where they're good questions that are worth, worth asking for the whole group, then I'll certainly try and answer those uh, and bring those into the conversation to, to sort of bring the conversation to life in, in response to questions coming from, from members of the audience. So if you have got a question, uh, do, do post it. You should see a Q&A box on your screen as well. Um, and OK. How come we can talk about this? What's, what's our rationale, experience? Um, wh why have we got credibility to talk about this? Well, at, at, at CB, at Gartner, we've been providing support uh, for our global clients around this combined assurance. It's called different things by different companies. Some call it integrated, coordinated, um, combined assurance. Um, we've been providing advice, guidance, support uh, to organizations running projects to bring greater uh, coordination, greater integration across their assurance activities. Um, for several years now, we have done webinars for our clients. We have run benchmarking surveys. We've identified case studies of great examples of companies that really made uh, big progress in, in developing and implementing and deploying a more combined assurance uh, approach. And we've run a whole series of, of meet, live meetings on this. In fact, I ran one in Johannesburg uh, a month ago. Um, where combined assurance is a very, very popular topic, driven in part by the commercial drivers we'll, we'll talk about uh, shortly, but also there by regulatory requirements called King 3 uh, and a new, new version of that report called King 4, which is, which is out now and extends the combined assurance uh, requirement to the public sector and to SMEs in, in South Africa. And indeed, we've got a meeting tomorrow in London being hosted for us by one of our uh, largest clients based here in London and about 25 um, uh, 
professionals are joining us. They're either chief auditors, chief risk officers, uh, or compliance officers joining us to discuss what they've been doing, hear from us in our latest research, uh, and pressure test their own thinking and plans with us in the room and also with a number of their peers uh, in the room as well. So we have a lot of very, very practical experience, and I want to spend the time today sharing some of that with you. Uh, I think the next slide, yeah. That's me. If you've never met me, that's what I look like and a little bit of my, uh, my history and background. Um, but I want to move us on to just calibrating where this group currently say you are. Thank you for everybody that took part in this survey. We, we sent out a very simple survey monkey to the whole group that's registered um, for uh, this today's webinar. And these are the results from the group, from this group. Uh, and you can see we asked 10 questions. I'll take you through those 10 questions and gave you four options. Uh, blue si uh, signifies you've already, already completed this activity. Red is it's work in progress this year. Green it's work in progress uh, for next year or beyond. And the purple is this is not a topic or not an aspect of combined assurance you're going to be working on. I wonder if I could ask, it's, I can hear a little bit of background noise. If you haven't already muted your phone, it'd be great if you could mute your phone and that will help keep the background noise down for, for everybody that, that, that's on the call today. So yeah, thank you everybody that participated in, uh, in the uh, survey here. Let me highlight a couple of things are, are on here. But first, just to talk through the 10 topics that we asked you to make sure that we were all thinking about these in the same way. So I'm going to start from the left and move from left to right. Joint risk assessment. This is all around conducting a risk assessment together across the assurance community. So maybe ERM together with compliance, together with audit, maybe also bringing in um, health and safety or quality into that risk assessment. Driving down the number of risk assessments that are con conducted, uh, doing it in a, in a coordinated uh, or integrated way. So joint risk assessment, the first one on the left. Next along, an agreed set of ranked principal risks. So everybody agrees, what are your key risks you face in your organization? And if we ask someone from audit, from compliance, from risk, or indeed from senior management, everybody would say, say yes, these are our top 10 risks or our top 12 risks, however they might be. And this is the sequence that, that they're in. So an agreed set of principal risks. The third one, an assurance map. An assurance map is a, a document, a matrix, if you like, which identifies on one axis either key risks or process areas, and on the other axis different assurance functions. And then in the cells, it identifies uh, either planned activity, uh, so which assurance teams are going to be doing work against each of those uh, risk areas or process areas, or it might uh, report conclusions or results of those review work. So an assurance map is an absolutely foundational step, and we're talking about this more. So building an assurance map to identify gaps, duplications, uh, and results, absolutely fundamental uh, to, to taking your uh, combined assurance project forward. Next one along, the known quality of the first and second line of activity. It's one thing to identify on, on an assurance map which teams are conducting reviews against which risks. The second and equally important step is to know the quality of those reviews. Are each of those teams working to a sufficiently high, rigorous, and professional standard uh, that they, you're all, um, your conclusions are all comparable in terms of rigor uh, and justification? Next one along, common rating schema. So if you have multiple assurance teams doing reviews, um, how do you rate issues for seriousness? Uh, do you use red, yellow, green? Do you use one, two, three, four, five? Do you use words to describe satisfactory, unsatisfactory, critical, whatever it might be? Um, for management, management will ask you, uh, as part of any combined assurance project, can you have the same schema? So if I see an issue raised by compliance, and they say it's a three. If I see an audit issue and it's raised as a three, I know they are being based on the same schema, the same ranking mechanism. Next one along, single database of control issues. All of the issues being raised by the assurance teams may include external audit and regulators, may also include issues self-identified by management, are put into a single database. So any assessment or evaluation of how many issues have we got, how many issues are in North America compared to Europe, how many issues are critical compared to medium or low? How many issues are open or closed? Um, it's being reported based on a single database of issues, irrespective of who identified them. 
Next one across, using staff across risk functions on assignments. So moving staff from compliance to risk, from audit to quality, from health and safety to information security, for example, to broaden their assurance perspective, their business acumen, their, their knowledge and ability to, to think about risk in a much more holistic way. And that may be for short-term projects or for, for longer-term kind of rotation or secondments. Fourth one across, uh, very short-term, very quick win, this one, is publishing a schedule of who is going to do reviews in different geographies or business areas. So if I was the country manager of, let's say, France, I would know now who is going to come and do a review in my geography in 2017, because the various assurance teams have shared their, sh shared their agendas or their schedules uh, and been produced as a for me as a, as a country manager, I know who's coming when and for, for what reason during the year into my business. Coordinated reporting, um, so can we provide a single view of the truth to management, to the risk committee, to, to the board? And then finally on the right hand side, are we joined up in terms of our onboarding of new managers, new executives and new board members? Um, or do they each get visited by legal, compliance, ERM? internal audit, external audit, quality, et cetera, to explain what their risk management roles and responsibilities are. So those are the 10 questions, the 10 areas we asked you about. And you can see that the responses uh, varied. I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Second from the left, agreed set of ranked principal risks. The blue is the biggest bar here. So that means most of you are saying we've done that. Uh, about 45% of you say we have already done that. We've agreed our key risks. But interestingly, 30% of you are working on it this year. Next along, uh, the biggest area for working this, this year, 2017, is documenting that assurance map. So creating an assurance map, identifying previously unknown gaps, previously unknown duplication uh, of assurance activity. So that's the biggest area you're going to be working on this year. And then over on the right-hand side, uh, use of staff across risk functions. Many of you saying got no plans for that. Some are doing it, you can see. So about 25% doing it. Sorry, have done it. 20% doing it this year. But about 40%, just over 40% of you not planning to do this at all. And then finally, the right-hand side, you can see the integrated or coordinated uh, combined onboarding of, of new senior people in your organization. Uh, almost a major, almost half are you saying you're not got a plan to do that. Interesting, when I ran this session, I, I mentioned just now I ran one in recently in Johannesburg, um, we discussed these at the start, as we're doing now, with their results, and we discussed them at the end, and the numbers had changed. The, the use of staff uh, and the integrated onboarding, the scores there changed dramatically after we had run the session. It was a full day session there, so we went into much more detail. Um, a lot of people have changed their minds that, yes, we do need to move staff across assurance functions to broaden their experience and knowledge. And yes, we do need to be more organized and, uh, in terms of our uh, onboarding and integration of, of messages for new uh, managers, executives, and, uh, and directors joining our organization. So that's just a quick intro. It gives you the 10 broad themes that we see many teams working on and the, the current status from this particular group uh, of where you are and what you're planning to do. So let's let's move us on. How am I going to spend the rest of the time we have together? I'm going to divide it into three broad areas. I'm going to talk about the assurance landscape. This is a bit of background, a little bit more building on what I've just, just been talking about. And essentially, it's like, what's the problem? Why is this an issue? Why is combined assurance, integrated assurance, coordinated assurance on the agenda for so many of our clients we work with, whether we're talking to the head of compliance, head of ERM, head of audit, it's on their agenda. They are all working to improve the alignment and coordination. So why is that? That's the first theme. Second one, if we're talking about combined assurance, actually, what is it? Let, let's, let's ground ourselves. Let's calibrate uh, and discuss and agree, actually, what is combined assurance? And then finally, on the right-hand side, uh, talking in a little bit more detail about what we're seeing our global network of clients doing in response to those challenges uh, and those pressures to have more coordination. So I'll be putting up a, a small graph, similar sorts of questions to what I've shown you, but not from this group, but from a, a global survey that, that we've done recently as to what our audit risk and compliance uh, teams uh, and clients are doing in response to this challenge and what action they, they have been taking. So. 
Let me just start us with a, just a quick summary here. Many of, many of you will be familiar with this complex and evolving uh, risk uh, environment that your organizations are facing. Let me just take you through what these five big drivers as to why corporate risk has changed and why um, uh, why it's it's so much more complex uh, now than it has been in 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 recent years. The five main themes listed uh, listed out here: um, regulatory fragmentation. Not only is there a lot of regulation, it varies uh, by geography and jurisdiction. So if you're operating in multiple countries, there will be anti anti fraud, anti bribery legislation and regulation in those countries. But it will be it'll be different in in some ways one from the other. Broad principles will be the same, but the uh, uh, the detail will, will be a little bit different. Um, OK, I've just, just been looking at some feedback. There's a little bit of a delay in advancing the slide, so I'll make sure I don't start talking about a new slide until uh, hopefully it will be appearing on your screens. Um, so reg a lot of regulation, a lot of fragmentation, a lot of increased enforcement around the world. And governments are short of money, so they want to enforce regulation and levy fines and penalties where, wherever they can. Information growth, everyone on this call will know huge amounts of, of data. I think it's something like 90% of the data we now have has been created in the last two years. Some, something absolutely unbelievable is how much data there is. The vast majority of it now recently is unstructured because it's videos in it and it's voice. It's not structured financial data. Uh, and the, the pressure to understand that data, to analyze it, to manage the risks associated with the huge increase in both structured and, and unstructured data. Because it, it contains corporately sensitive information, it absolutely also contains customer sensitive information. The interconnectivity of risks. Um, risks are often thought about in silos as separate uh, issues. But we know in reality there is interconnection. If one risk occurs and actually crystallizes, that's likely to be the cause of another type of event occurring. So there's a domino effect, if, if you like, the interconnectivity of risks. All of you will be working for organizations that have got suppliers and customers. You may also have joint ventures, consortium working, partnerships, um, outsource providers. So the the question is, where does your risk responsibility start and end through the extended enterprise? And particularly, fourth parties, not just third parties, but fourth parties. Um, so the suppliers of your suppliers, or the outsource company that your outsourcers have outsourced to. So um, where does your responsibility uh, start and end? And then finally, the transparency. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of publicity, both through organized uh, journalists and, and media outlets, but also individuals, whether they're customers or employees, um, are, are ready to post uh, an adverse comment about your product, your, your people, uh, your service uh, on, on the internet uh, and on social media. So a lot of, lot of uh, very fast 24-7 scrutiny. So with that background, um, what have people been doing? What have companies and organizations been doing? Well, they've been investing in assurance. Um, at the bottom here, you can see the, the growth in assurance function budgets. Uh, I selected just four of them. Um, over the last few years, you can see oh, the, the screen hasn't advanced yet. OK. Um, well, when the screen does advance, you'll see uh, a chart which it's, talks about the growth in assurance budgets um, across four selected uh, areas. So compliance budgets over the last few years have increased by about 10% on average across the world. Uh, moving from left to right, information security budgets have increased, ERM budgets have increased, and data privacy have increased phenomenally in, in recent years. What, what this implies, um, firstly, there's good reason to, to spend more for the reasons I was just talking about. But it also implies there's silo thinking going on here. We've got specialist risk teams focused on particular risks and particular issues. So we have compliance teams, we have information security teams, ERM teams, privacy teams, etc. So as a result, you can see at the top of this little graph um, that nine out of 10 organizations that we surveyed recently are planning to reorganize. And by that, we mean rationalize their risk management approach holistically. If you look at how much time is spent reviewing what you're doing, how much money is spent with the teams to do those reviews, and how much management time and attention 
is, is needed to be reviewed and to agree the results and to take any necessary remedial action. So there's a lot of activity self-checking within organizations. And senior management particularly is thinking, well, can we do this more efficiently, uh, more effectively in a different, in a different way? These, these are in budget terms. Um, so this is in, in terms of what people have actually been seeing in terms of their budget increasing. So you'd need to discount it slightly for the effect of, effect of inflation over those years. But let's take a, a step, step back and look at that, think about that siloed uh, question in a little bit more, more detail. And here's just a really, on this page, when it, when it appears on your screen, you can see we've, we've pulled out and in a little bit more detail uh, the type of activities that many organizations have. Um, and you can see at the top in that sort of gray box as a headline, at the average company, the number of distinct assurance functions has doubled since 2008. So you might have a compliance team now. You'll definitely have a legal team. You've probably got a risk management team. If you're a manufacturing type organization, you've got some sort of quality team. You'll have internal audit. You've definitely got a finance team. You've got a strategy team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can probably tick many of these uh, many of these functions off as appearing in your organisation. Um, one thing that's missing on here, which which we should have had, is is insurance. Another team that does reviews, does risk assessments, uh, and is involved in assurance uh, to a degree uh, as well. So a lot of investment, a lot of teams, a lot of activity, uh, but a siloed type approach. So what are some of the problems that are caused by uh, a siloed approach. You can see here uh, we've highlighted them. And I'm really going to focus on what's in the blue box at, at, the, at the bottom. I'm going to read these out. There are six potential problems that we've highlighted at the bottom there. First one, duplication of effort. So what's the difference? What's the, 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 the clarity over the roles and responsibilities between ERM and compliance, for example? Um, they might be clear, the different teams might be clear, but are your operational management clear? So what, what, where does the role of remit and the mission and mandate uh, start and stop? So is there likely to be duplication of effort? Or indeed, perhaps even worry, more worryingly, gaps um, where we're all assuming someone is doing a, a review over the controls in a particular area, but actually no one, no one is doing it. So unknown gaps and duplication. Increased total cost, as I mentioned. Um, all of these teams having increased investments, so increasing team size and budgets. The effect of um, increasing assurance activity, in increasing risk activity, um, means that it's, it's, it's higher up on the agenda for the corporation, for the organization. There is more time spent on it. And that results in what we've called here operational drag, slowing things down, increasingly risk-averse management, delaying decisions and, and uh, seeking more information before we make a decision. I'll come on to that uh, in a little bit more detail in, in a moment. So operational drag is a big impact. Increased focus on downside. Let us understand how this could go wrong. Let us put in controls, checkpoints, authentication, milestones, approvals, review mechanisms to make sure the bad things don't happen. Now clearly for some things that's, a, that's essential, health and safety for example. But other things that focus on the downside completely removes any focus on the potential upside uh, of uh, issues, of initiatives, of, of projects. So excessive, excessive uh, focus on downside uh, and drives a risk-averse management response. Fragmented view. Um, so you have multiple views of the truth. So audit may be reporting to uh, the risk committee, and they'll be reporting maybe saying things are satisfactory. Um, health and safety may not get visibility at the risk committee or the audit committee. Um, compliance will likely to get visibility there, and they might say things are a, a three. Um, and then ERM comes along, and they say it's yellow. Um, so confusing differences of opinion, differences of coverage, differences of timing and cadence. Uh, and different vocabulary. Uh, and so it's very confusing, very hard to get a holistic uh, single view of the truth. Uh, and finally, working to different standards. Um, so you can't actually compare the results from one review team to another because the, the rigor, the professionalism, the standards they're assessing things against are very different. So you can't add them all up in an easy way. Plus, there's some indirect costs, which I alluded to. Um, 
So let me just talk about some of the indirect costs that come through from, from this as well. Um, you can see the first one here, I, and I mentioned this, slowing the corporate clock speed. When we talk to strategists, um, they say our business is too slow. Uh, too slow to identify opportunities in the market, too, too slow to respond to those opportunities uh, in the market. So often the response is, we need more information before we make a decision. Uh, we need to discuss this again. Let's bring it back onto next month's committee agenda. Or we need more people to be involved in the discussion. Let's get a view from uh, some other people in, in the management team. An example of how that manifests itself, on average now, the time taken to hire someone since 2010 has increased by 50% because we have another stage in the recruitment process. We have to coordinate diaries with another couple of people so they can uh, join in the assessment panel or they can have a, th their own separate meeting, one-to-one -one meeting with a candidate. Uh, and so on average, it's taking 50% longer to hire someone than it did a few years ago because of that slowing of the corporate speed. Second in indirect uh, cost is around the burden. Um, if we continue to increase the checks, the controls, the review points, the authentication steps, uh, approval, approval steps, and milestones, um, there's a couple of things that happen. Um, firstly, teams try to avoid it. Uh, you can see the, the bottom point on that top right box, 43% uh, of compliance executives report that their operational management colleagues avoid the compliance review process. So for example, if there's a checklist you need to go through before you sign up with a new vendor, a new supplier, 43% of operational management are trying to circumvent, trying to avoid that checklist because they see it as too slow, too burdensome, too difficult. They just want to get on with their project or their business uh, activities and get this new supplier on board. Similarly, in terms of information security, uh, people see that as being too burdensome. They will work around it. So they will share passwords. They will write things down on a post-it note. Uh, they will leave their PC logged on when they walk away from the desk because it's too burdensome to uh, lock it, to, to close your PC down, to log off, whatever, whatever it might be. So people responding uh, by uh, working, working, around, uh, working around the controls that have been put in. Thirdly, an incomplete risk picture. Um, I'm going to highlight the, the second point in this particular box. There are over five executives reporting to the board in the average audit organization, the median organization, who have some responsibility for uh, risk or assurance. So that will be the CFO probably has some. Uh, head of audit will be, will be there uh, at a board meeting. Legal will typically be there, maybe reporting also on compliance issues. HR will be there reporting on people issues, and there may well be someone else from, from operations or from IT. So a number of executives uh, reporting to the board, and as I mentioned before, probably on a different basis, using different rating schemes, uh, and coming up with different, different conclusions. And then finally, on the indirect cost, um, risk avoidance. And this is the other side of the risk equation. Uh, I spoke about earlier. The, the focus on reducing the number of bad things that happened. This is the other side of the equation, um, the, the difficulty or uh, the avoidance of the potential upside. So missing opportunities uh, to drive success in your organization. So missing the upside or the opportunity. Um, and this is shown by a couple of things here. Um, we're not going to fund projects um, because we're, we're nervous about whether uh, the risk is understood or, or the risk is, is uh, something we're happy to take on. Um, so risk aversion permeating through uh, the avoidance of corporate growth uh, projects, corporate uh, R&D uh, opportunities. So what are the key drivers to changes? That's what people are doing, and that's why it's costing money. Let me just uh, summarize. What, what would be the main drivers why management are asking uh, their assurance colleagues in their teams to do something better. The clamoring for coordination, as we, as we put it here. I'm going to highlight a couple of these, the board and business leaders. The top one there, boards are saying, can we have one view of the truth? I don't want to see a separate report from ERM and another one from audit and another one from compliance and another one from any of the other assurance teams because I don't understand how they fit together. So you guys go and make it fit together and provide a single heat map, dashboard, whatever you want to call it, 
to the executive committee, to the audit committee, to the board. Um, I want to see one view of the truth, so you go and make it happen. Make, join it all up. Um, and then secondly, on the business leaders, that the main driver here, if I could summarize it in a single phrase, is assurance fatigue. Too many reviews, too frequent, taking up too much of my time, taking up too much of my team's time. Um, it's just too excessive. It's too burdensome. It's too frequent. Do fewer. Do them in a more organized, coordinated way. So that leads to the key question, which is at the bottom of the page. How can we better manage risk at a lower cost? Um, so we still want to manage risks, obviously, but how can we do this more efficiently? So let me, I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to ask you uh, for your input at this stage. So I've got three very simple polling questions. I'm going to put up one after the other in, onto your screens. So firstly, I'm going to ask you, who is leading your, assure, your, your aligned assurance project? Um, I'm going to keep this open for a minute to give everybody, hopefully, a chance to um, uh, to, to start replying. Um, so in your organization, who is leading your combined assurance, coordinated assurance, whatever, whatever you're calling it? Um, we will summarize, sorry, we will um, share with the whole group that's on this the, the aggregate results from, uh, from the group. I'll, I'll share it momentarily on your screen, um, uh, but then I will also um, email it around to, to everybody uh, over the next couple of days so you can see what the aggregate uh, results were. Don't worry, we, we can't see how any individual is responding to this. All we can see uh, here is the aggregate results and the, the overall percentage, which uh, I will share. I think this is going to be an automatic thing, hopefully. So I'm going to stop voting, and it now should appear on your screens. Let's see if it does. Yes, there we go. You can see the aggregate results there. So for the people that are on this webinar, uh, risk is leading your combined assurance project. Well, we may have slightly self-selected here, because this is a webinar being run through and with the IRM, so we're more likely to have risk folk on, on the call than maybe legal or, or audit. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. So 46% uh, of the projects are being led by risk, uh, and then in second place, 30% by by audit. Let me go back to the list of questions. The second one is, when did you start? When did you start your combined assurance project? Was it last year or before? Was it this year? Actually, we're going to start it next year. Or, you know what? We're not going to start it. We're never going to do this. This doesn't make sense for us. So again, this, this will be up on your screen for a minute to give everybody a chance to, uh, to vote. And then we'll do the same again. I'll share the results so you can see how everybody else voted. Um, I know on some webinars, people want to get these results very quickly. So here's a clue. They take a photograph. When I share this screen in a moment, you might want to take a quick photo of it. And then you've got the aggregate results right there. Uh, and you can share those um, with anybody in your organization that wants to know them uh, immediately. So I'm just going to leave it open. Interesting. Interesting. There's a lot of people who've got no plans for an aligned assurance project, even though you're on the webinar here to hear all about it and why, why, it's, a, why it's a key topic. Right. I'm going to stop the voting now. Thank you for that. And therefore, it should appear again on your screen. There we go. You can see it on your screens now. Um, so th a third of you started uh, last year or before. About a quarter are starting this year, and 29%. Um, I've not convinced you you need to start this at all yet. Um, we'll see. Maybe I, yeah, maybe I should run that, that question again at the end, see if we change anybody's mind. Right, let's go back. Third and final one. Same thing. You'll be, you know exactly how this is going to work now. For those of you who are running a project, um, what are your main goals? What's the purpose of your combined assurance project. You want to improve reporting to the board, to management. You want to have greater understanding of who's doing what in terms of assurance activity to make sure there's no duplication or gaps. You want to reduce that assurance fatigue across the business uh, and, and help out your operational management. Or it's a general, we just want to improve risk control, make sure we're, we're doing it well. 
we'll make sure management are doing it well rather. Um, so we're improving that first line of responsibility, the quality and uh, activity in the first line. Okay, it's going to stay open for another 10 seconds. Um, and then again, I will share the results. And you can see how your answer compares to uh, everyone else that's on the call. Okay, here we go. I'm going to share those results. There we go. So you can see everybody else's, uh, and then you know how you voted individually, um, and you can compare and contrast what, what your option was, uh, what your answer was compared to, to other people. Okay, thanks very much for, for contributing to, to those, those three questions. Hope you found that interesting to see how you compared. All right, I want to build on one of those, uh, the goals. Um, I've mentioned, the, mentioned this, this briefly, but at a higher level, the goals are great risk assurance, increased risk visibility, so you know what risks you have across the organization, but also strategic intelligence. Let's help our senior decision makers, whether that's board, executive committee, senior management, make right decisions, make the right decisions, uh, invest in those big bets, those growth bets, as well as manage risks down, um, really to, to help push the organization forward towards uh, success, whatever your goals are in the private sector or the public sector, lar large or small. Okay, moving forward. Second theme, if, if, those, if that's the background, that's the rationale, that's the drivers to, uh, to having combined assurance on people's agendas. What are people doing about it? What do you mean? What do we mean by combined assurance? What are the key components? How can you take action? So let's start talking about the, the answer uh, now. So I want to start with very basics. Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with the concept of three lines of defense. I'm not going to labor it uh, in, in a lot of detail. I just wanted to start us off with this as a fundamental concept. The first line of defense being management, operational management, and employees who are closest to the business activities and should be taking responsibility to understand their risks, understand the necessary controls, and deploy those effectively and consistently. Second line of defense, sort of people we've been talking about, ERM, compliance, quality, health, and safety, responsible for these sorts of things. Um, putting in place a risk management process, writing policies, running tra developing and running training programs, collecting risk information. And then internal audit as the third line, um, providing uh, independent objective assessment across the whole organization, all locations, process areas, and, and all risk types. In some, some teams we're talking to now, they talk about a, a, a fourth and a fifth line. The fourth line, you might include uh, the external audit and regulators, those, those external inspection type, type teams, and the fifth line being the board of, board of uh, um, directors uh, as also an, an independent oversight function. So whether you're, you're sticking with the traditional long-standing three lines of defense or your, your concepts are, are four and five line, all the, the building blocks are, are, still, are still there. So that's a fundamental uh, a fundamental uh, building block for a combined assurance. In terms of definition, uh, you can see a definition at, at the top. Uh, I'll let you read that. Um, my job's not to read out everything on, on every page here, but it's all around working more transparently, more visibly together across the risk and assurance community. I have to say there's one thing I'll point out here. We're using the phrase integrated assurance, and I've used combined assurance, coordinated assurance. We hear and, and we know from some clients that that causes unnecessary friction because it implies in some organizations uh, activity that's not actually included in the project. So it, it typically doesn't include changing reporting lines, mandates, reorganizing teams, and therefore sometimes integrated assurance can be taken to mean exactly that. And so a more neutral term, which we're hearing more and more often and which we're starting to adopt, is aligned assurance. A very neutral term, doesn't have any um, misunderstanding associated with that term, with that phrase. Um, we're not talking, deliberately not talking about anything which is to do with reorganization, reporting lines, mandates, mission statements, etc. The key elements you can see uh, in the box at the bottom of this page, a, a methodology, method an organized process <laughs> when you go, you go through, uh, understanding what the key risks are, uh, understanding the assurance that's being provided by, by different teams, uh, remove, identifying, removing duplication and gaps, involving management and assurance functions and audit working well together, 
making sure we're providing enough assurance to uh, satisfy the board and their stated risk appetite and risk tolerances, uh, and determine if there's any improvement that is needed to the overall assurance activity, the board oversight, their risk appetite, risk tolerance state statements. So that's that's the fundamentals of what it's going to include. Um, what are the key components? Um, or oh, sorry, I've gone on two pages there. Let me go back one stage. The hallmarks, as we call them here. Um, now, this is a great page. You might want to print this page out because this could be used uh, as a checklist to uh, review your current status. It could also be used as an agenda or talking point for any conversations or discussions you're having with your compliance, audit, health and safety, uh, information security uh, colleagues in your organization. So for talking through each of these four boxes, starting top left, do we have a common risk universe? Do we all agree what our key risks are? Do we agree how we're going to rank them? What is it that determines this is more serious, that is less serious? Are we doing our risk assessments together? Can we coordinate our risk assessment activity? Can we co coordinate our planning so that we're not, for example, going to the same location uh, one month and then someone else is going the next month because that's burdensome for local management? Can, how do we determine who's the right assurance partner to do the work? Have they got the necessary skills and professional standards? On the activity on the top right, um, how do we identify where there is unnecessary duplication? Uh, in reviews and activities. How do we identify if there's unnecessary or, or excessive or duplicative control processes in the, in, the, uh, in the environment, in the organization? And how do we decide that I can rely upon the work of someone else so I don't need to duplicate what the compliance team does or the ERM team or the audit team because I know they've done it to a, a, co a co common level of standard? Bottom left, um, do we build a, a single database of controls, a single database of issues, a single database of uh, incidents and report findings? Do we do joint activities? So we're scheduling on-site rev on reviews to be carried out at the same time. We see that in a number of teams where they go uh, at the same time to the same location, still conduct their own independent work, but it reduces the burden on management if there's two teams on-site at one time. And have we thought about the benefits of rotating staff between assurance functions? And then bottom right, um, are we coordinating our reports so that operational management or executive management or the board are seeing re fewer reports which contain the results from more assurance functions? So are we providing a single view of the truth? So if that's what you want to end up at, if that, those are your goals, those are your success factors, if you like, how do you get started? Just advancing. So here's some suggestions to how you get started. Um, bring your assurance colleagues together. Sit around a table and talk about some of those problems that we've discussed earlier in, in this morning's webinar. Are you seeing demands from your board for a single view of the truth? Are you seeing complaints or hearing complaints from the business about assurance fatigue? Are you having multiple reviews around the same risk area or process area? Um, over, overlapping uh, coverage, overlapping uh, in, in terms of the burden on, on operational management. So share some of those pains, share some of those uh, f that feedback, share some of those concerns across that assurance community. A couple of things I'll say which are not written down on this page, but having had many, many conversations with, with risk leaders, uh, with compliance leaders and, and audit leaders, a couple of things I'd say, start small. Um, you may have more people than we represent on, on this little uh, uh, diagram here. You may have uh, health and safety. You may have information security. You may have a number of other uh, specialist assurance teams. Um, start with those folk that are more positive about doing this and working in a more integrated, a more aligned way. Um, make it easy. To, to get going, make it easy to build some momentum, make it easy to get some agreement on a better way of working, and then broaden broaden the team, broaden the committee, perhaps a little later on. So you know your colleagues, you know the culture in your organization, but we've all probably sat on committees, and we all know a committee of four people is easier to reach agreement than a committee of 20 people. 
So our advice, very practical, is start smaller. Don't include everybody to start with. Build some momentum with those that are more positive uh, to this concept. Secondly, don't underestimate the amount of time, if you're leading this project, that you'll need to socialize. Because people will misunderstand, uh, misinterpret what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it. They'll be sensitive to any potential changes in their mandate, their mission, their responsibility, their visibility to senior management, their, their uh, credibility in the organization, their importance to the organization. So a lot of one-to-one -one informal conversations outside of the committee meetings to help make sure everyone is genuinely understanding what you're trying to do and why, what's involved in the project, and what's not involved in the project. So some operating principles on the right-hand side. Uh, if you have already some sort of risk liaison type committee, then, then maybe use that and, and put combined assurance, put aligned assurance on, on the agenda. Um, focus on coordination first. Share your plans amongst this group. Share your, uh, your ways of working. Talk about how you conduct reviews, how you reach conclusions. Um, focusing on activity uh, first. And, and build respect, build trust. Um, understand roles and responsibilities. Don't try and change them, uh, certainly not in the, short, in the short term. So teams will still conduct their own assurance based on their own mandates, uh, their own responsibilities. Um, but work on that, that quality standard. So if another team is doing some work, does that mean I can do no work in that area? I can rely 100% on their work? Or is it going to reduce the amount of work I do in that area? Or is it it's so poor quality, I still have to do the, the work I originally planned in that area. And if it is uh, work that's not of the right standard, how can you help each other to improve the quality of that work? And so you can start to rely more on each other in terms of the work you're doing, the robustness of the results, uh, and the impact uh, of the reports. So looking forward, uh, you're definitely going to need some sort of structure to, uh, to how you organize this. You'll not be surprised to know, based on what I said earlier, we have built uh, a, a guidebook on how to do this. This is uh, part of the uh, opening pages from that, that guidebook. Um, it puts a structure to it. You can see there's four phases. Um, let me tell you about the four phases at the top in those blue chevrons, and then I'll talk about some of the action steps uh, which, are, which are in those, in those phases. So the first phase is, the, is kind of the setup phase, if you like, understanding why we need to do this, how quickly we want to do it, who's going to be involved. So the kind of the setup, the foundation stage. The second is, is starting to work on building that framework, uh, getting the assurance community uh, to, to start to understand what each other are doing and how we can start to work together. Uh, the third phase there is, is actually doing some of that work in a coordinated way. And then finally, as with any project, as with any major initiative, let's see if we've delivered the benefits and the positive outcomes we were expecting to. If not, how do we need to refresh either to move quicker or to do things a bit differently to, to deliver the business benefits that we originally expected uh, from our combined assurance, from our aligned assurance project. So those are the four phases. Let me talk about uh, some of these in a little, little bit more detail. Um, the readiness assessment, as an organization, are you ready to do this? Do you have some positive uh, assurance colleagues that want to work together in a more aligned way? Is your board demanding one view of the truth? Are your operational management feeling a lot of pain and feeling uh, assurance fatigue? Um, so have you got the pain? Have you got any uh, consensus, a community feeling that we need to do, thing, do things better? Second step there, uh, defining the goals and getting buy-in from your stakeholders. So what is it we want to do? What for us will be success of our aligned assurance project? By the end of 2017, if we have done this, it will be successful. By the end of 2017, we need to have done these things. So maybe it's agreeing our principal risks. Maybe it's building a common language. Maybe it's we will, by the end of 2017, be creating a single view of the truth that goes to our board and audit committee. Uh, bringing together the results from different assurance communities. So what is it that's going to be success uh, for you uh, as an organization? What will be the major benefits? Uh, okay. Um, and the, the, the final point on that first, first column is this, with, from our experience of working with many, many organizations, is not a 12-month project. You will certainly make progress 
by the end of 2017, you will not have uh, done everything you want to do on the aligned assurance uh, agenda by the end of 2017, or even by the middle of 2018, 12 months' time. So it's, it's probably a one to two year project for most organizations that we've worked, worked, to, worked with. Um, so plan, plan sensibly, uh, be realistic about goals, goals and milestones. A um, couple of things I want to talk about in phase two. Um, putting a, a charter together, or some sort of uh, definition of roles and responsibilities. If, how is that um, community of assurance leaders going to be working together? What kind of, what's, what's the role of, of the combined assurance forum, if I could call it that? Um, and maybe start doing some of the things we've spoken about, conducting joint workshops to, to agree your key risks, developing a common language. Uh, what makes this thing a high risk? What makes it a medium or a low risk? Um, and agreeing those thresholds, those definitions, um, the criteria you would use uh, across different risks, different process areas and geographies, uh, and different assurance teams, so you, are, you can agree uh, why this thing would be a high risk, or indeed if this control failure was identified, whether that is a critical control failure or an intermediate or, or a, low, a low, um, low importance type of issue. Um, third column. Uh, building that assurance map, absolutely foundational, uh, really understanding who is doing what, whether you're looking backwards in terms of who did work in what area for 2016, or whether you're looking in 2017 for what work is scheduled, uh, and then maybe you're going to reschedule some work to avoid unnecessary duplication or fill uh, unknown gaps. Um, so building that assurance map, but equally important, uh, assessing the quality of the second line. Uh, each of the second line functions need to be operating to a similar level uh, of quality, uh, professional standards, robustness, rigor, however you want to call it. And, and so work done uh, can be shared and results can be relied upon. And then in the fourth column, as I mentioned, this is tracking the business impact and the business benefits. Um, so at the end of a quarter, the end of six months, the end of the calendar year, have you delivered the expected benefits? Are you seeing reduced assurance fatigue, for example? Have you been able to produce your first or your second uh, combined assurance report, uh, at the, the single view of the truth that's gone to your board or your audit committee? Yes, yeah, so working through that, that assurance map, identifying key milestones. OK, so let's see. In the final section, um, I mentioned that uh, I've got some information about what our global network of clients have been doing. A single, a, a similar to the survey we ran with this group that I shared very early on as, as the first, almost the first page in the material on um, on your status. So let's see. Uh, this is looking globally across organisations uh, and uh, across countries and geographies. So this is where where people have told us. Um, so let me tell you what, how it's organized in terms of color. The, the sort of mid-blue at the bottom is, as you can see, completed. Next one up is completing this year. The dark blue is will complete in the next two years. And the gray at the top is not planning to complete. And you can see we have six, uh, we have six elements that have been identified here. So let me take you through these again, Le left to right. Creating a shared database of findings. So all of those issues, whether they've been uh, reported or identified by management, by a second line team, ERM or compliance, by a third line, such as internal audit, or by a regulator or external audit, wherever the issue has come from, however it's been identified, it's being put into a single database. So that, that obviously means you've got a common rating scheme, um, so they're all rated in the same way. And you can see 50% of our, our clients, when they completed this survey, have already done that. Uh, another 9% completing it uh, that year, and 20% uh, in the near future. So that's the most uh, implemented uh, response and activity. Common risk language, um, slightly less. Um, this includes uh, how do you rank issues, how do you rate issues, um, as well as um, uh, yeah, so, so creating a common risk language. Um, the third one, integrated risk assessment. So we have a joined up risk assessment. Um, I was talking to the risk manager at a bank recently. She said, we have 19 risk assessments carried out at our bank each year. 19. And the organization said it is 
too many. There need to be fewer because um, they're, they're operating at different timescales, different criteria, different teams are leading them, but they're all evaluating and um, operational management and taking time of operational management and, and their teams. So can we build an integrated risk assessment, maybe a single risk assessment, so we all agree and sign up uh, for that risk assessment process and our different work is, is based upon it. Uh, two reporting, uh, next two columns. The, the next one is about integrated reporting for management. So if we're doing a review for an operational management process area, so a country or a process area, um, does he or she get a report which includes the results of recent reviews done by various assurance teams? Or do they get multiple uh, assurance reports from each individual team at whatever time they've done a review in 2017? So there's multiple reviews, multiple reports, kind of an endless flow of assurance reports with actions to take place and criticisms that, that are in there? Or can we provide a more holistic report to management? And then sec the next one along is the doing the same thing for the board or the board risk committee, the board, board audit committee. And then finally on the right hand side, uh, the restructuring. So a small number of teams uh, use uh, user combined assurance or an aligned assurance project as part of a reorganization of the assurance community, changing reporting lines and responsibilities and mandates. Um, but not many do that, and uh, not many do that. You can see the vast majority have no plans to do that, which is why I mentioned right up front, kind of the socialization concept is very important, and using the right term, which is why aligned assurance uh, is a great term, because it has no implication that there's going to be a reorganization or restructure uh, of responsibilities and, and of teams. Um, a couple other things that, that are not in there. We, we, we ran this survey a little while ago, so we had 10 things in the survey that we asked you about. There's only six things uh, in here. So there's a couple of other things that, that are not in here. Um, the coordinated onboarding, the rotation amongst assurance staff, uh, and building uh, a single uh, assurance agenda for the calendar year and sharing that with operational management. Um, so that's that's how people are responding. Um, this is what action uh, clients of ours, whether they're audit focused, being led by audit or by risk or by compliance. Um, for those of you that work for member organizations and you want more support, more information as to how um, CEB and Gartner can provide support and insight, uh, and share case studies and effective tactics on this, then do get in touch after, after the webinar and we can talk about uh, how we can provide more support to, to you as you want to take your, uh, your program forward. Um, there's a couple of uh, pages in the appendix. I just want to pause here for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you can see my name and email on there. Secondly, there is the email address if you want to get access to today's slides and download them. Uh, and it should just be uh, coming up onto your screen. My screen is advancing much quicker than yours, I think. Um, but that will be coming up shortly. And just when that screen, sorry, when that slide is on your screen, it'll be also a great time for me just to remind you, if you haven't already, but just before you leave, if you could rate the webinar, please. Because um, obviously, as I mentioned up front, the IRM and, and us here at CB Gartner want to make sure we're delivering great webinars and great insights for you. So any commentary, feedback that you have as to how we could, uh, I mean, you can tell me it's brilliant. I mean, that would be great if you want to tell me it's brilliant. It's the best, best thing you've ever done, best webinar you've ever been on. That would be fantastic. But if there are areas, seriously, if there are areas where uh, you can think we could, could improve uh, the delivery uh, and the support we're providing um, through, the, through the webinars that, that we do, please, please do let us know um, uh, when, you, when you feed it, uh, provide us feedback. Um, so with that, uh, it's... Let me just check. There's a couple of questions. We've got a couple of minutes to go before we get to the 60 minutes. Um, yeah, question about um, is there any difference if I'm working for a bigger organization or, or a smaller, smaller organization? Um, no. Uh, the, the same principles apply, the same pain points in terms of uh, the, the demand for a single view of the truth for senior management, the same complaints about assurance fatigue by operational management, um, and that therefore the same drivers uh, and, and pressures uh, will be there in a smaller organization as opposed to a larger organization. Um, potentially it's easier because in a smaller organization you may already know quite well your assurance colleagues. Um, if you're in risk, if you, you probably already know the, the, the compliance or the audit people. Um, so that, that can make it a lot easier to, to 
build that uh, consensus and, and get get things moving. It may not be quite so formal uh, and structured, and maybe a lot easier to uh, to socialize and, and and get get things moving. Um, the other question, another question, is about uh, using combined assurance in a bank. Uh, banks and financial institutions are a little bit different because there is there is regulation there that certainly requires separation of compliance, risk, and audit functions, but they don't normally uh, preclude working together in an aligned way, as long as there's certainty and clarity about who's do, who is responsible for doing what type of work. Um, that, that there's no that absolutely no harm in relying upon each other's work to an extent. So if you're internal audit and you know compliance has done a high quality piece of work, absolutely rigorous and very recently, you can leverage that and that can influence the amount of internal audit work that you need to do in that very same area in, in the in the near in the near future. It may not um, it may not allow you to do no work in that area, but it certainly is a factor you can take into account when you plan the timing and depth and scope of, of the work that you need to do. Uh, so that takes us to 12 o'clock. That was our 60 minute for the webinar. So I'm going to close the webinar now. Um, you should be able to get access to the slides through that uh, URL. Uh, the webinar when we close is automatically then uploaded onto, um, onto the website shortly afterwards. So if you wanted to share the, the recording uh, with team members, uh, or, or for other reasons, you can certainly do that, uh, and we'll also be emailing it out to everybody that was on the on the webinar today as well. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to close it here. Um, so this is Ian Beale from from Gartner here in London. Thanks everybody for for joining, um, and uh, appreciate your participation in the survey before we ran the webinar and in those polling questions during the webinar. Look forward to seeing your feedback, uh, and maybe you'll dial in again when I do my next webinar for the IRM. So thanks very much, and good morning.